A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I am your host, Cam Edwards. Uh, um, Apologies in advance. My allergies are absolutely destroying me today, so uh, if I'm a little scratchy, that is why. Do appreciate you being here on the program. We're going to be taking a look at what's going on in North Carolina, the uh, gubernatorial race between Mark Robinson, a Second Amendment champion, and uh, Democratic Attorney General Josh Stein, who is, well, anything but a Second Amendment champion. Uh, you know, it's it's amazing to me how Stein is trying to present himself as this sort of moderate voice in the uh, gubernatorial race. This week, he uh, brought up or actually was asked a question about guns at an event, but uh, before he started talking about what he would like to see in terms of North Carolina laws with firearms, he uh, told the assembled crowd, I am fighting for you, all North Carolinians, for your fundamental freedoms, whether those are reproductive rights or voting rights. To be able to do this work has been a great honor for me. Okay, so he's fighting for our fundamental freedoms, all of them, he says, right? Uh, that must mean the right to keep your arms, too. I mean, that's a pretty fundamental freedom. And not so much for Josh Stein. Same event. Uh, he talked about combating the scourge of gun violence. And again, in an attempt to portray himself as moderate, he didn't lead with the gun control efforts, right? He talked about, well, I want to hire more school social workers, want to hire mental health professionals, something that, you know, most of us would probably agree with. He says kids shouldn't have to worry when they're in school and parents shouldn't have to worry about their kids when they go to school. And then he turned his attention to gun control, stating that implementing a red flag law, uh, which uh, would allow an individual's close relatives to petition courts to seize their firearms if there's a threat to public safety, and enacting, quote, comprehensive statewide background checks would also prevent guns from getting in the wrong hands. So, yeah, red flag laws and universal background checks. Uh, not exactly what I would call fighting for our fundamental freedoms, right? Kind of the opposite, as a matter of fact. Now, there are a couple of things, however, that Josh Stein did not bring up in his campaign stump speech. He didn't talk about banning so-called assault weapons, right? He did not talk about banning high-capacity magazines, didn't bring up sensitive places or anything like that, Uh, although I'm sure he's in favor of all of those things. But again, This is about trying to tack to the middle here. But if you go back and you start looking at press clippings from just a couple of years ago, Josh Stein was um, much more willing to talk about his support for gun control endeavors. So in 2022, he addressed the Fayetteville, North Carolina chapter of the NAACP. And when he addressed the uh, NAACP there, he also brought up guns. And this time he did talk about AR-15s. Now, to be fair, Stein did not call for an outright ban on so-called assault weapons. Don't know if he's in favor of that or not, but what he said two years ago was that the age to purchase an AR-15 rifle should be raised from 18 to 21. He said, we don't let young people buy a cigarette or a beer, but we let them buy an AR-15. just doesn't make any sense. And you know, in a way, he's right. You're 18. You serve in the military, you serve in a jury, you get married. You you are an adult, right? You're a young adult, but you are an adult. So why shouldn't 18-year-olds be able to buy a pack of cigarettes or a can of Skull if they want to? Why shouldn't an 18-year-old be able to buy a six-pack of beer? I'd be all in favor of lowering the age for those purchases from 21 to 18. I'm not, however, in favor of raising the age to purchase a firearm from 18 to 21 because we are. Again, talking about legal adults here who have full access to their right to keep and bear arms. Now, if you don't think an 18-year-old is responsible enough to own an AR-15, do you think they're responsible enough to own a pump-action shotgun or a bolt-action rifle? Do you think that they are responsible enough to possess a handgun? Got to be 21 under current federal law, right, to purchase a handgun. 18 to purchase long guns, which again, doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's the way the law is. I'd be fully in favor of one standard, but it should be a standard again that reflects the age of majority, not a standard that tells young adults, actually, you are going to have to wait a little bit longer before you get to exercise your fundamental constitutionally protected rights. 
Now, that was the only thing that Stein talked about two years ago. Uh, he went even further. He, uh, quote, also called for comprehensive universal background checks. All right, he's still doing that. Uh, to ensure that certain people cannot easily legally buy guns. Among them, now this is what's interesting. The, the reporting standards that Stein wants to see included in a background check. Violent felons. All right, well, they're already covered. People on the anti-terrorism no-fly list. People with domestic violence protective orders. That's going to be addressed in the Rahimi case. Or those with, quote, pathological mental illnesses. All right, so there are a couple of very interesting provisions there, right? Started with the no fly, no buy list. Now, this has been a goal of gun control advocates for a long, long time, since basically as long as the no fly list has been around. So we're talking about almost 20 years. I remember Rahm Emanuel, uh, this is probably 2008, 2009, I think it was in the maybe, it was right around the time Obama uh, was inaugurated, but I can't remember if he was already in office. It might have been 2010. Rahm Emanuel was speaking at a uh, Brady Center gala. Yeah, because gun control groups hold galas, I guess. They don't have like annual meetings or conventions or anything like that. They just galas where everybody gets dressed up and rattles their jewelry and appreciation when somebody calls for banning firearms. So Rahm Emanuel talked about the uh, no fly, no buy list. And he said, you know what? Uh, let, let's make politics with this every day. If you want to tell me that somebody who's accused of being a terrorist should be able to buy a gun, oh, I'll have that debate with you every day. The only problem is that that's not what the no-fly list is about. You know, you can be on the no-fly list or the terror watch list and not be suspected of terrorism. You could work with somebody. You can be related to somebody. You could live near somebody and be on that list. And once you're on that list, by the way, when you're on the list, you don't necessarily know that you're on the list. Which is one of the problems that even the gun control activists have had with their proposal here. Because you've got some folks who are in favor of the no-fly list who say, well, but we don't really want those folks to know that they're on the no-fly list until they try to fly, obviously. So we don't want to alert them if they were to try to buy a gun that they're being watched. Not the best argument against a no-fly, no-buy list, I will admit. But it is an argument that has been made. But again, you don't know why you're on the list. And it is a ridiculous challenge to try to get off the list. Excuse me, I'm trying to fend off a uh, allergy-related coughing fit. It can take years and tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees for you to finally be removed from that list. Now, again, you're not accused of a crime in the meantime, right? You certainly haven't been charged with a crime. You haven't been convicted of anything. Your name is just on a list. And Josh Stein says, well, as long as you're on that list, you shouldn't be able to buy a gun. I don't know about you. That raises all kinds of constitutional concerns for me, especially when this is, in essence, a secret list, right? We don't know how somebody gets on the list. We don't know what it takes to get off other than a lot of time and some good attorneys. But as long as a bureaucrat is willing to write your name down on a piece of paper somewhere, that's good enough for Josh Stein to say you should not be able to purchase a firearm. What about pathological mental illness? What does that even mean? Are we talking about somebody who, again, has been adjudicated by a court as uh, mentally defective? Somebody who has been involuntarily committed to a mental institution? Because, again, the current law is that those people can't purchase a firearm as is. Now, I don't think this is what Josh Stein was talking about, because why say you're in support of something that's already on the books? That's not typically what gun control activists do, right? So it seems to me like he wants to expand this. And again, using a very amorphous term, well, you're not just mentally ill, you're pathologically mentally ill. So again, how does that work in practice? If somebody is receiving treatment for depression or anxiety, are they pathologically mentally ill? If somebody has been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder or any of the other, you know, uh, alphabet uh, diagnoses that are available to mental health professionals now, does that automatically preclude them from exercising their Second Amendment rights? I mean, I got to tell you, so A, this is problematic, again, from a constitutional perspective. But this is also dangerous 
from a mental health perspective. You know, there should not be a stigma attached to getting mental health treatment. We want people to get mental health treatment, right? We want people to talk to a counselor when they are feeling troubled. We want people to reach out so they know that they're not alone, so they can get help, so they can recover, move on with their lives, and live their lives to the fullest possible extent that they can. Now, what happens if, as Stein says, all those labeled pathologically mentally ill are told that they can no longer lawfully possess a firearm? Again, we're going to broaden this category of prohibited persons out to whatever degree Josh Stein wants to. I would suggest that the biggest impact is not going to be on preventing people who are dangerous to themselves or others from acquiring a firearm. The biggest impact is that people who are struggling, who are going through a crisis, are not going to reach out for help. That's what's going to happen because they are afraid of the consequences of reaching out for help. Josh Stein might think that he is doing something to combat gun violence, but what he is doing is adding to the stigma of mental health care. Now, Maybe Stein's revised his position. He didn't bring it up again this week, at least not that I'm aware of. But gun owners should be deeply troubled and concerned by Josh Stein's casual disregard for our right to keep and bear arms and for his callous attempt, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to, uh, again, use mental illness as a cudgel to deprive North Carolinians of their Second Amendment rights. There is a stark choice for North Carolina gun owners when it comes to the Second Amendment this fall between Mark Robinson and Josh Stein. And Stein, again, I think is, I, I don't think Stein is coming completely clean about where he stands. I suspect that Josh Stein falls right in line with Rob Bonta, the Attorney General of California, Gavin Newsom, Kathy Hochul, Phil Murphy, all the rest of the gun grabbers. But you don't win a statewide office in North Carolina by uh, embracing your anti-gun ideology, right? You do it by downplaying your beliefs, by masking what it is that you want to do, by only talking about those uh, gun control measures that pull well, as opposed to the gun control measures that the prohibitionists really want to put in place. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We will start there. Here's the headline. Gunman in expressway roadway shooting, road rage shooting, was on felony pretrial release. This is from the fantastic website CWB Chicago, which covers crime in the Windy City better than any other site I know. They're talking about a uh, guy named Jervon Whitaker. He was charged with shooting at another driver during this road rage incident. And as it turns out, yeah, he was on pretrial for le- uh, release for a felon theft case at the time. According to CWB Chicago, Javon Whitaker is the fifth person accused of murder, attempted murder, or trying to shoot someone in Chicago this year while on felony pretrial release. This particular shooting took place back in January. Illinois State Police, who responded to the scene, found, uh, quote, bullet defects in the passenger door and window, as well as the rear license plate and trunk area of a man's car. Um, the man, thankfully, was not injured. Investigators were able to use license plate readers to identify the uh, vehicle that Whitaker was in. Uh, it was apparently a rental car. Uh, they learned that Whitaker had rented the vehicle. They identified him as the person who was driving the SUV at the time. They arrested him last week on a charge of attempted murder. Uh, Judge William Fahey detained Whitaker this time around, citing, among other things, according to CBB Chicago, the fact that he was on felony pretrial release at the time of these allegations. As CWB Chicago reports, uh, they started back in November 2019 uh, documenting individuals, again, who have been accused of killing, shooting, or trying to kill or shoot somebody while they are on trial, or while they're awaiting trial, on felony charges. Um, And there have been a lot. Last year, there were 18 individuals who were charged with murder who are out on pretrial release. There are another 17 who were charged with attempted murder. Seven were charged with the aggravated or reckless discharge of a firearm. Uh, the year before, 2022, you had 50 individuals who were charged with attempted murder who were out on pretrial release, and 29 who were charged with murder 
while they were on pretrial release. So 2023, as bad as it was, actually somewhat of an improvement for uh, the city of Chicago in Cook County. And again, Democrats in Illinois, soft on criminals, right? Tough on gun owners, man. You own a 10-round magazine? Ooh, that's a criminal charge. You possess one of those uh, so-called assault weapons without registering it with the Illinois State Police? Oh, that's a crime, too. Meanwhile, you know, I guess the good news is if you do get arrested for those charges, odds are you'll quickly be released, right? At least until your trial. Now, today's armed citizen story from uh, Jackson, Mississippi, actually technically, I guess, West Jackson, where a store owner is speaking out after shooting a suspect in self-defense in the town. Uh, This happened just a couple of days ago. Musa Ali Ghana says he has not been the same since the incident last Friday. Says he has never had to defend himself to the extent that he actually had to take somebody's life. But he was outside of a store. He runs a little convenience store. He says he was cleaning. And he looked up and he saw this guy and he said, as soon as I looked at him, he just took the knife and he chased me into the store. So. He runs into the store, the knife-wielding assailant uh, close behind, and Ghana says the man's telling him, I'm going to kill you right now. Uh, Ghana said he just kept chasing me all the way to the door, and as soon as I saw the knife come up to my stomach, I was trying to hit him with my gun, but the gun right there popped off. So he says he was not trying to shoot the intruder, but the gun discharged and fatally struck the uh, knife-wielding assailant. The uh, man who has yet to be publicly identified by police, died at the scene. Kind of says it's not the first time, though, that he's had a run-in with this individual. He says three days before the fatal shooting happened, he said the guy came in the store, threw all kinds of drinks on the floor, said he would open the drinks and just leave them being high, basically. He said, I'm the one paying for the damage. Now, after the shooting, Ghana was taken into uh, custody by the Jackson Police Department, uh, later released without facing any charges. and. You know, he says he had no other choice. He says, what would you do if somebody came with a knife? He said, no matter how strong you are, you can't find a person with a knife in his hand. No way. He said, I gave him enough space chasing me around the store. It didn't work. And ultimately, again, he was forced to act. After investigating, uh, the Jacksonville or the Jackson Police Department uh, confirmed that the shooting was ruled a justified use of force. Pagana says that he had to close his store for his own safety because of threats from the suspect's family. So it's not even known at this point if uh, Musa Ghana is able to be open for business at this point. Continue on trying to provide for himself and his family because the uh, family members of the suspect who was shot and killed, again, making threats against his life. All the more reason, I would say, for uh, Ghana to carry a firearm in self-defense. It sounds like those threats have not abated and may even be increasing. Now, that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I want to thank you for uh, joining me on the program today. Don't know if you're going to hear the rain that is now pounding on the roof, but uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, anyway, hope that you have a, a great Easter weekend. Thank you again for being a part of the program today. I'm looking forward to being back with you again on Monday. I will be with you next Monday and Tuesday before I take a couple of days off. And, of course, we'll be updating BearingArms.com throughout the uh, holiday weekend. Maybe on a lighter posting schedule than normal, but we will be posting new content. So I'd encourage you to visit BarionArms.com. If you like what you see, I'd also encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member. Just use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP or VIP Gold membership. We're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, news stories, analysis, opinions, because your support really does matter, and it truly does make a difference. So thank you again, and we will see you again very soon. Until then, be well. Be safe, stay dry, and be free.